Welcome to the Keen Run Yoga podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keenonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Today's guest on the Keenan Yoga podcast is Luke Jordan. I met Luke almost 20 years ago. Like everyone else, was immediately struck by his intensely deep thinking. Luke is originally from Belfast in Northern Ireland. He has taught around the world for many years, setting up the well-known Ashtanga Summer School in the Netherlands and now a yoga centre on the Portuguese coast with his partner, Sonia. After this initial meeting, I met him many years later in Mysore on one of many trips he made. As a seasoned practitioner now, an Ashtanga teacher, and it was shortly after this reunion that he was certified to teach and having completed the advanced A series, as well as the inordinate quantity of times needed in Mysore to grant this highest of accolades. Luke, however, remains his own person. He has a master's degree in Indian religion and is certainly not invested in any dogma, or as he might put it, normative ways of thinking. In fact, try as I may, I found it very hard in the interview to pin any belief on Luke whatsoever. As I remembered him, Luke is still as advaita, non-dual, in his perspective as ever he was. And a battle ensued between us as I tried to suggest some further or deeper reason for practice in life. So, welcome Luke to the Keenan Yoga podcast. Pleased to have you. Um, how's it going? Hey, it's going very well, thank you. Yeah. Uh... Um, how do you start? Tell me how you started yoga. I started yoga. Through. So yeah. I was doing my finals at university. Yeah. And uh, I'd just come out of a period of, uh, well, actually, that had happened a few years before. I'd, I'd been kind of depressed at university. And uh, what did you study? I studied politics. Did you? Huh. Yeah. Which would make anybody depressed studying yeah. politics especially when Northern you're Ireland. from, uh, when you're from <laughs> yeah. Northern Ireland but it's, it's funny because uh, people from Northern Ireland tend to have uh, tend to be very good at politics because yeah. you you grow up with it and uh, you spend so much time talking about it yeah that you know all you do is argue mm. Mm. and then whenever you see the politicians on the TV all they do is argue and they're incredibly good at it. And then you get to see these mechanizations of arguments. Mm, mm, uh, right. Yeah. And so you develop these skills and it was useful for going to university to study politics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you came to it pretty young like me and I was doing philosophy in the UK and you were doing politics in Ireland. So, and then you, and you got into No, no, I, I was doing it in, I was doing it in Scotland. I was studying. Oh, in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Where are you? Didn't know that. Oh. So up in the up in the cold and dark Edinburgh. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Study study Scot- politics in the cold. Yeah, and dark. yeah. I could see. I could see that that we might have got to. <laughs> and you, uh, <laughs> so was it yoga or, or Ashtanga yoga you got into? It was the very first class I did was Ashtanga yoga, and that's that so it. weird. I know that's oh. so because as a few people have said it to me, and I kind of think. That's really unique just to get into that straight away. And I would not have dared to get into Ashtanga. I... Yeah. So, so even, I mean, there was just something in my mind telling me that I needed to do something like that. Mm. Like I needed right. some kind of discipline to ground me and stabilize me. And uh, I went to that first class and immediately I started practicing every day. Just out of that really strong necessity. Right, uh, mm-hmm. because I I I had been uh, dealing with what some people would call an illness, and I perceived this could be something that would really help me. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
So it was out of that need to have something like that in my life uh, because I didn't trust, you know, I didn't trust the the medical establishment and with my depression health. you're talking about. So that you know, with that depression, you were so you're really seeking. Yeah, depression, depression, a cure, depression, yeah. psychosis. You know, whatever right. you want to call it. Right. And uh, it, it very quickly became clear to me that I didn't trust the the medical establishment with my health, that it was something that I needed to take into my own hands, whether that was through diet and exercise, uh, because the medical establishment didn't see a connection between what was going on with me and, uh, you know, lifestyle choices. And in fact, there was one doctor that I asked, I asked if I could see a dietitian because I thought that might have something to do with my, you know, my state of mind. And it was a few years later, I actually, under the Freedom of Information Act, I got my, uh, my medical records. And he had noted this down, that this request of mine to see a dietitian as symptomatic of my illness. <laughs> because this because That's this crazy. idea That's that crazy. your diet crazy. Yeah. might have something to do with your state That's of mind. Just, yeah, yeah. That's, That's crazy madness. thinking. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, you must be bonkers if if you're if you're thinking that way. So so very, very quickly, you know, I, I had this feeling, right? I have to if I want to be healthy, I have to take I have to take that into my own hands. Yeah. I'm yeah. I'm responsible for my health. Nobody else is. No government, no health establishment. And that's well that you know, and that sounds like an obvious thing, but it's an unusual it's unusual thinking, right? It's unusual thinking because what people tend to do is they they tend to hand over this power to experts. I think because, not because not because they're necessarily because of inclinations, but because uh, there's certainly a strong lobby to do so, let's say. Absolutely. We're conditioned mm. It, we're we're grown up into society which conditions us that experts know more than us about us. Yeah. Well, so whether it's doctors a or or gurus or you know who, whoever it happens to be, we're we're uh, you know we we learn not to trust our own inner intelligence and to trust expert opinion instead, which I think is really upside down. Right, so you started with the Ashtanga, and who was that with, by the way, up there? Were, were we? Uh, actually, it was in uh, it was it was uh, the yoga center Edinburgh, and uh, actually Hamish had been there. Yes, uh, it's true. A few he had started the uh, yoga center in Edinburgh with a friend called Nick, and I had gone for a class a couple of years before, which was taken by Hamish, but I was late, so I just watched through the window. And then uh, it was a couple of years later, it was a guy called Mark taking the class. Mark Young, I think his name was. Uh, and, oh, Mark. You know, I was incredibly impressed because I went into the class and, you know, we're sitting there, complete beginners. And, you know, he's just doing a, a little bit of a routine and, you know, he does a couple of sun salutations or whatever. And he lifts himself up into handstand, which I thought was <laughs> Pretty impressive. And I thought, right, this is the yoga I want to do. Right. And you started practicing every day. And did you notice an improvement? Or how quickly did the improvement come? Uh, yeah, actually, it came pretty quickly. You know, right. I, I guess I had uh, a degree of flexibility. Like I could touch my toes. I couldn't do like a full forward bend or anything like that, but I could touch my toes. And then, you know, slowly, you know, within months, Things were changing very quickly. But your mental state? Mental state? Uh, no, I was, I was stable enough, you know. Uh, I was in a pretty good way. It was just about developing. I guess what I was looking for was a kind of psychic strength. Mm. And uh, yeah, I felt like I felt like I was getting stronger in some way. I mean, it's, it's, mm. it's hard to remember because... It's hard to disassociate the stories of what was going on with me then from what was actually going on with me then. Right. And also, I mean, that was, uh, well, you started when you were pretty young. I mean, must have been like 20, right? So. Uh, 23. Right. 
So none of this is getting any younger. I mean, you must be towards 40, 40 ish now. So that's, that's I am a long 40, time. 44 now. Are oh, you 44? It's so kind of. Yeah, a year older than me. Um, I, what they call what they call middle age. I know, I know. Don't start going down that road. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So, but like you start on yoga, and then you, and then how quickly did you go to Mysore? After, uh, after well, that. when so when my degree finished, uh, yeah. You know this idea of like working for a living didn't appeal to me at all because I couldn't see anything that I really wanted to do. You know, there was ideas floating around. What, I mean, what do you do with a degree in politics? You know, become argue. a lobbyist or argue become a yeah. politician yeah. or, you know, or journalist. You know, maybe something like journalism attracted me slightly more, but still there was nothing. The only thing that I was interested at that time was, was yoga. And so I wanted to I wanted to to develop that, and uh, I sought out well, who's going to be the best person? And you know, at that time there was a very very small list of people. I know on the Ishtang, yeah. Ishtanga dot com <laughs> website, and there was one. I think well, there's one or two. Actually, I think there was only one authorized teacher in the UK, and that was Hamish. Wasn't he certified even at that point? At that point, he wasn't certified. Oh my god! Yeah, I know. Uh, it's like he was an authorized teacher. Different days, and yeah. so yeah. he was teaching. Uh, so I decided, okay, I'm going to go to London, right, and uh, uh, develop the yoga. And actually, there was also a girl I was kind of chasing down to London as well, who'd been a girlfriend. Which you know, I think not- I, you know, I think I met. You must have met you around that time in London, you know. Like once, uh, like a couple few times, we had some shared friends, and I think um, that must have been yeah. the time. But I thought you'd gone to Mysore before that, right? No, I met you after I'd been to Mysore. I think. Okay, right, yeah, yeah. With so uh, maybe after yeah. I'd met Stuart because yes, I met Stuart yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, so that was after two thousand and five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, so, um, so I was first in London in year two thousand at the end of my de- after my degree finished, and. and- yeah, Hamish was teaching at the uh, in the Royal Homeopathic Hospital. Yeah, in Great yeah. Ormond Street. Yeah, and Di- you Diorama. know, it was just I remember stepping in, and it was it was so different from you know the classes I'd been to. I mean, it was just I felt like wow, this is it. I've arrived. It was incredible, just like the energy of like the thirty plus people, you know, and. The, the focus and the concentration, the intensity, the heat, the humidity. How you, I mean, you weren't, you weren't, you weren't um, working. How were you supporting yourself? Were you teaching at that time? Well, I, uh, I very quickly got a temping job. Right. So in the mornings, I'd go in and I'd do my practice. And then after mornings, after, or after the practice, I'd go and do filing for the rest of the day. <laughs> 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 filing in shitty offices which well well i mean it wasn't work that i particularly enjoyed but yeah uh, it it was the yoga practice that kept me going and i had in the back of my mind that uh okay i'm going to save up the money and i really really wanted to go to india mm-hmm. but so i i didn't quite have the confidence that i i thought that i could do it and then it's just like different things happened. Somebody bought me a, like I didn't, somebody bought me for Christmas a travel guide to India. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, wow, this must be a sign. Because <laughs> I don't think even, it wasn't so much common knowledge that I really wanted to No, learn. not at all. Not at all, yeah. You had to get a Lonely Planet uh, or something, yeah. Yeah, it was Lonely Planet, I think. And then yeah. Hamish also said to me, well, look, you should go to Mysore. And that was it. The, the decision was made. So Ham- Hamish gave me the push. And how was it? I mean, you did, did you, where did you find yourself? Was it in the old show? Or no, it was just about in the new one, wasn't it? Are we called the middle show? No, no, it was two, the new 2001. New it was right. uh, Lakshmi Puram. Ah, oh, so it was. Oh, God. Right. Yeah, yeah. It was so how, so like, how, how did you find that time? Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> I love... It was just like... Uh, just... 
completely changed my life. Because, you know, here is, I thought, wow, what would it be like to travel and to travel to such an exotic place? And, you know, I was, I was, I was scared. Mm. Uh, and then my, my fears were exacerbated whenever I stepped <laughs> off the airport in, in Mumbai. And there's that, there's like an invisible line at the airport where yeah. once you cross over it, you're in India. And here was me, like a very green, uh, young, naive person. And I was immediately prey for all of the hawkers. So I think in that, like in the first five minutes crossing the line, I probably lost about a thousand rupees. <laughs> and my prêt à manger sandwich, it was all yeah. kind of given off just to try to get rid of people. But of course, the more I was trying to get rid of people, the more they were coming. Yeah, yeah, Until yeah. eventually I paid somebody to let me know where the bus was to get the hell out of there. Uh, and I happened to be, be, be standing beside the bus stop. So <laughs> it, it was, a, it was, it was an, a relief to arrive in Mysore. And then I remember getting the rickshaw, which pulled up in the Lakshmi Puram neighborhood. And then there was immediately people that I recognized in, from, from London that I knew from Oh, London. right. Okay. Yeah, so it felt it felt immediately like being at home. Mm. And how how are your experiences then? Because I mean, it's a really these days it's a unique experience to have been to that old shala and have you know it was twelve people in the room, right? So you were practicing. It was twelve people in, in the room. Yeah, in a very and, kind of constrained environment. But uh -huh. How was that? There was hard, there. I mean, there wasn't a lot of people there when I think there was just about thirty people there. Yeah, and then that thirty people kind of dwindled as Christmas approached. So, you know, there wasn't, I think there might've been like two shifts, uh, but you know, it was, it was such a big thing for me because of the anticipation that had built up over mm. the year that I'd been practicing, mm. you know, mm. I'd seen yoga mala and, uh, everybody, I mean, anybody who was anybody in the London, Ashtanga community had been to Mysore. And so it was a talk about this person's been to Mysore, that person's been to Mysore. And, you know, I guess going to Mysore was the key to being part of the group mm. or key to being more central to the group. Mm. Uh, so I, I had a lot of anticipation and, uh, yeah, it, it it felt in a way like going to Mecca. You know, it was like going to the yoga Mecca. And your experience is that were you satisfied with that? Like um, you know, I mean I had I had an amazing time. Right. I really, really you know, that 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 first trip, it was just like here I am and I'm here in the world enjoying life and it what felt what it felt like for me is now having done this mm. anything is possible right mm. because i would never have imagined that you know years years before that i would go to india and that i would be doing yoga and and it just felt like it just felt like my world opened up I mean, I mean, you know, I, I also I, I I I met someone there, and you know, had a romance, and uh, no, I it was a very it was a very beautiful time. I was going to say, how many times have you been now to Mysore? I mean, you must have been. Oh, I've no idea. Yeah. I I so I don't, I don't count. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, how but is there, it? there's this thing, there's this status thing about how many times have you been to Mysore. And I noticed that like the first time I was there, it was like, if you'd been more, it meant you were more of a somebody. And uh, I always thought, you know, that's kind of bullshit. I suppose I was kind of like sequestering into kind of asking you how you've perceived the times changed from the time you went first of all to the time that is now in Mysore. Uh, I think one of the things that was really special about that first time I was in Mysore was that there was a lot of older practitioners. Mm. And uh, I think that there's a different quality about those older practitioners 
is that they were, you know, they were, I guess, children of the 60s and 70s, born with a certain seeking. And a lot of them, they're, you know, there was no internet when they went to India. You know, there was no sales pitch for them to go to India for any particular reason. Yoga wasn't a thing. These people, they were the trailblazers who went yeah, because yeah. they had a genuine seeking for some, or at least at least this is my story. They had a genuine no, it's true. I mean, seeking I've for both, some alternative. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, David Williams to, went overland on a bus. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> so the, twice, these, these, he's the only person there. These were, you know, these were seekers. And I think what's changed over the years is, you know, there's still seekers who are looking for yoga, who are looking for some kind of alternative to mainstream Western material culture and the thought systems that go along with it. But, mm. Uh, there are also probably a, more consumers. Mm. That that's what's happened over the years. It's people trying to, you know, not look for an alternative because yoga ceased to be an alternative. Yoga turned mainstream, and so then going to Mysore or going to India just became another feather that you could put in your cap or put on your yoga CV. And, uh, you know, I think life became, I mean, when I was there, you know, I, I was a, I guess, I guess you could say a spiritual tourist. Uh, but, you know, life in Lakshmi Purim still had a little bit of roughness around the edges. But, and I think over the years, it's become increasingly comfortable. And it's become mm. increasingly easy for Westerners to, to go to India without really going to India. You know, you, you go and you hang out with all of the other Western people. You know, maybe you take a music class or you take a Sanskrit class or something like that. But primarily, you know, you're, you're hanging out on a kind of yoga campus with your Western buddies. And not that there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there is. But I think that's one of the differences compared to how it was. Mm. I mean, I, I, don't, well, I don't want to kind of project some kind of romantic notion that it was somehow better in the 70s or the 80s. <laughs> it wasn't. It was, just, it was just different. I mean, that's just a different form of spiritual no, it materialism. It was definitely better. It was definitely better. I mean, I remember kind of the first time going, and it was like, a lot, yeah, there were lots of, of the older generation still there. That was something and that was special. And then also there were people, also there was people on the street as well. Like latterly when we go, like everyone's in watching Netflix after practicing the whole day or something, you know, like when we first went, you know, like there wasn't so much internet engagement, right? Like you could get your emails and stuff. And so everyone was out talking to each other. That's better. Categorically better. Well, I don't know. But better, better is a nor- better is better is a normative judgment, which I well, in a pragmatic personally, terms, but- I would ref- refrain from. Yeah. <laughs> it depends what you're looking for. You know, that's not what you're looking for, so it's not better for you. What was um? What were you looking for on the, on the early trips, and has that changed now in terms of what you're looking for out of your yoga now? Hmm. I think I think uh, in my earlier years with yoga. Uh, I was a believer that there was something I could get. And I think what's changed for me now is I don't believe that there's anything I can get that will make me more whole and complete as a result of doing yoga. Right. So, so what, were you, uh, what were you after in the early years? Like enlighten, enlightenment? You know... It, <laughs> I probably would have liked to have believed that I was looking after enlightenment, but yeah, you know, if if I'm to look, if I if I'm really really honest, I wasn't at all. You know, I've uh, there's there's somebody I've come across whose work has really uh, influenced my way of thinking recently. It's a guy called Marshall Rosenberg who uh, has a technique called nonviolent communication, but the way he talks about human beings 
is generally we do things because we're trying to satisfy needs. And it's what all human beings are doing. And what I see is that yoga practice was satisfying a myriad of my needs and still does. You know, it satisfies my need for uh, connection and belonging, it satisfies a need for health and significance and, uh, you know, it satisfies my need for food, you know, and increasingly I'm seeing that that's, that's what spirituality is, mm -hmm. you know, it's just being alive, satisfying needs. And it, it's, 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 it's very human. So you don't have any kind of further transcendental aspirations with yoga anymore. It sounds like a very I like the I like the idea of these transcendental aspirations. I like, think I like about, the idea of it. Yeah. What do you think about the idea the asanas are, are uh, kind of stimulating different um, energies in the body or, you know, what do you think about that idea? It, that sounds like a really nice belief. Right. To me, and it, it it wouldn't be it wouldn't be something that would drive my practice, uh -huh. you know, because it would also make a normative judgment that there's something more uh, that there's something better if you're you know your kundalini is rising up through your svadhisthana chakra or whatever mm. than uh, than the normal person who's you know, working a nine to five job and raising their family. And I, I don't believe in that normative distinction. And, you know, it, it, it's for me, that's kind of in a realm of fantasy. And then, okay, so say you stimulate something in your body, mm -hmm. then it goes away. You know, I've, I've, you know, I've had different experiences, you know, of, different energies running through my body. And, but then, you know, you come back to earth again. And then if you choose to keep chasing those experiences, what are you? You're, you're, a, you're an addict. And then you live your life trying to get back to that uh, place of high. So why do yoga at all then? What, what's, what's the purpose? Well, it's satisfying human needs of mine. Right. Uh, so one is the health of the body. You know, I'm 44 years old now and uh, like my body's never been in better shape. In terms of practice, like my body's never been in better shape. So it satisfies a need for health on, and, you know, it satisfies an egoic uh, satisfaction of, you know, being 44 and being in really good shape. Uh, So that's, I mean, there's a myriad of needs that yoga satisfies, but it, in terms of, uh, in terms of it being some mystical, mystical esoteric thing, that's not one of them. Right. There's more, more kind of pragmatic terms. Well, I would say n not pragmatic, but human. Uh -huh. And I think. I think humanness is spirituality. I think the spiritual, the idealistic mystical spirituality is often transhuman. And uh, like to not be human is somehow uh, better than being human. And I think true spirituality lies in one's humanity. So Apart from satisfying the needs, how does the yoga practice itself kind of do that? Does it does it help? Does it help you be more human? I would say one of the things that maybe it does, and I don't I don't know this for sure, uh, but it helps me be in tune with the intelligence of my body. Mm. Uh, you know, I know, like if I've you know, haven't had enough sleep, I can feel it in my body. Or if I've been eating certain kinds of foods, 
I can feel it in my body. Uh, so if I move a certain way, I can feel it in my body. Being able to listen to the body's intelligence, you know, it it speaks and it makes suggestions about what is uh, a, a more whole and integral way of moving than another way. So it's like a it's like a conversation. It's like a continuing conversation that I have with the body's intelligence and you know sometimes i listen more sometimes i listen less but you know yoga is not the only way of doing it you know i like for instance people can dance or they can do tai chi or you know anything and that will help them develop some kind of relationship with their inner intelligence Hmm. I think it would be wrong to glorify yoga as the one and only path. You know, it's it it can be a path, but you know, to where I have no idea. And maybe some people do it yeah. and they become less yeah. intelligent. It depends upon how it's done. You know, if you do the same thing day in, day out, but you're not paying attention. You know, you can uh, concretize those patterns in yourself that mm. are averse to listening to that inner voice. Isn't there something useful about doing a kind of repetitive practice? I mean, you've chosen a, you know, a yoga that is quite repetitive. It has a pattern. Well, it's it useful has... for me. I, I see. I can't. I can't talk about anybody else. Right. Right. I mean, I. I. I find it's useful for me as. Uh, and there is an element of story about this. I find it useful for me as uh, a stabilization tool, as mm -hmm. a, a means of having that conversation that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean. It's also it's it's it is never the same every day. I am always exploring. Well, if I move, you know, say this rotation this way or this rotation this way, and you know, for me, it's a it's about listening to the sensations in the body, listening to the sensations and the breath, and just seeing where it leads to. So it's it's an exploratory tool rather than yes, it is a discipline, but Yes, I was gonna say, otherwise why haven't you kind of gone up and, and done free dance every day, you know, for for an hour and a half or something? What's the what's the difference between that and Yeah, and I I think that that could also be a great doorway to to that to that to the uncovering of that same intelligence doesn't have to be yoga you know there's there's people who are doing yoga because they think they should and i i couldn't think of anything worse <laughs> than thinking that you should do yoga yeah you know life is way too short you should be doing what you want to do you know you should be doing what you enjoy and it just so happens that i really enjoy doing yoga but on the other hand, you enjoy it partly because it, gave, it gives you stability. It gives you the sense of, as you said, you know, the start of psychic, you know, kind of a psychic you sense know, of stability. Wait, no, no, I mean that's the that's 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 more Adam. That's more the story about what it does. Right. In the moment, I enjoy stretching. I love stretching, and in that moment, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing something that I love stretching and feeling sensations in the body and also having challenges you know so like these days i incorporate a few more handstands in my practice uh and it just it feels like a really nice challenge and it's also i enjoy the feeling of strength that it gives you know the the practice happens in the moment and everything else about the practice outside of that moment is a story about the practice you know, it's there and then. Breath and movement 
stretching, sensation, feeling. So it sounds to me like you still wish, like as much as you adamantly deny anything other, it sounds to me like you still wish for clarity. You still wish for presentness in the moment as it is, rather than you know entering into this uh, in your terms the story as it isn't. Right? What, what's better with them? Um, well, I want I want to be clear. Right. I want to be clear when I talk about it. Yeah. That I'm not misconstruing. Uh, my what I what I really think about yoga. I want to be clear that I see it as something that happens in the moment, and then outside of that, everything else that is said about it is a story. I don't have a problem with the story. Yeah, that's just going to say not at all. Yeah, but I don't want to misconstrue the story of yoga as yoga, because you know one of the things that I have grown up with in the world of Ashtanga Yoga is we were kind of taught to believe things. Or there was senior figures within the hierarchy of yoga that uh, perpetuated beliefs about the mythologies of Ashtanga Yoga. And personally, I find uh, these belief systems really unhelpful. You know, like the story of the Yoga Korunta or the story of the greatness of the Guru or whatever the story happens to be. Is there nothing in your mind that thinks the tradition, you know, can be, is there, is there no aspect of you, of you that thinks the tradition could be helpful? I love tradition. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I, I also, I chant the Vedas and I, I, I learn that in a very traditional way. Mm -hmm. by somebody who's teaching it in a very traditional way. I love tradition, but what is it? It's culture. And culture is not the truth. Culture is culture. So you learn a particular form of culture. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with it. I mean, I, I, it's like going to an art gallery, right? And well, so Ashtanga Yoga is, 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 like a, is like a painting on the wall of the Tate. It's like your favorite artist, you, except it's one that you get to participate in. I think also with your, along with your human needs idea, I mean, regardless of whether there's anything outside the human needs or not, even within, within this, this, what I see as a pragmatic viewpoint of, of yoga and what we're doing here, um, you still need the human need of meaning. I mean, the, more than anything, we need context in our life. We, we need significance. To our being, right? This is a this is a fundamental mm -hmm. need, and you know, after after you know, food and shelter, we need we need a sense mm -hmm. of our own context and significance. Um, Could surely, be. right? And mm -hmm. well, I mean, you know, unless we're somewhat enlightened, um, you know, and we need to feel our lives are meaningful. Um, and does that not relate to the way that you practice? It gives you a, a sense of meaning, and within that, yes. you know, you have to believe in. Yeah, yeah but I mean, I don't, I don't have to believe in it in order for it to give me meaning. You know, I right. don't have to believe in the stories about it in order for it to give me meaning. What I can do is I can love it. I mean, I think uh, that's what gives me meaning, is studying something I love, doing something I love. That's what gives significance. Not, not that I have to buy hook, line, and sinker the mythologies. It's like reading the Mahabharata or reading the Shiva Purana. Mm. I, I love those stories. I don't believe in the stories. But I, I love them. And there's why do you love? Why do you love them? If, if they if they have no meaning to them, why, why do you love them? There's a. Uh, did you ever see that film Life of Pi? Yeah, I couldn't watch the whole thing. Yeah. I didn't, yeah, I started. Or, or read the book. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, it's the, the story of that is there's some guy in a boat. Yes, uh, I remember that. After part, a yeah. shipwreck. Yeah. And he makes, up, he makes up this whole story about what happened. Right. And then at the end of the film or the end of the book, you know, we learn that the truth wasn't the story. And the, the crux of the film is, well, what do you prefer? Do you prefer the truth or do you prefer the story? And that's uh, well, the, the 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 life of Pi relates that to spiritual traditions and religion. And uh, 
That's one of the ways we deal with reality, because reality is something completely unknowable to us. And so we create stories in order to deal with the unknowableness of reality. So where does the and yoga philosophy fit into into this viewpoint or you know your viewpoint or your practice because I mean that's definitely for me that is yoga philosophy you know yoga chitvritti nirodaha yoga chitvritti nirodaha yoga is a state uh where there's no stories but even that even the idea even the idea that there's a state where there's no stories is a story that we cling to. And so then you have to even let, you have to drop that one. And then when you drop that one, where are you? You're right where you are. Where you've, you know, always been trying to escape from. Isn't there a kind of clear method and aim in, in Patanjali's thoughts towards yoga though? You've got the method of involvement, effort, you know, awareness, focus, and you've got an aim, which is, and the aim is... It's, uh, it's awareness. I think aw you're absolutely right. Awareness is the, is the key, is the, the yatnaha, is the effort. And, and he also, uh, there's also a clear aim. The aim is... is Tatrastito yatno bhyasa. Is transcendent, you know. I mean, potentially, isn't talking about fulfilling human needs. He's talking about becoming one with God. No, I, I don't think it's transcendence. Uh, I don't. Th I don't think he really is. There's a clear God stipulated. It's it's dualistic. There's a God, and you are to become one with. No, God. no, 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 no. no. There's okay. a there's okay. a deep there's a deep misconception about the role of Ishvara in Patanjali, right. uh, and I anybody wants to. Get to the bottom of that. It's uh -huh. it's been you see, Patanjali's notion of Ishvara has been taken over by the theists, by the people who believe in uh, Krishna or whoever it happens to be. But that's not Patanjali's God. Patanjali's God is a meditation tool. If anybody you know wants to read more about that, the person who I think delivers it clearest is a scholar called uh, Lloyd Fluger, uh, and. He's very clear in his analysis that, you know, this Purusha Vishesha that has been uh, never untouched is an idealistic tool as a seed of meditation. It's not an interventionist God that's going to clear away the obstacles from your path. It's, the, it's, it's an idea of the untouched Purusha that is closest to our own imagined human nature. So we're not trying to become one with God. We're, uh, as far as I understand, Patanjali's uh, methodology, which is, uh, which is nothing other than Sankhya methodology, is in the peeling away of the layers of ignorance to uh, come to understand what our true nature is. Uh, at least. You know, and I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with that as a method methodology or disagree with that as a methodology, but I think that's the clearest interpretation of Patanjali. Right, but the true—I mean, so you know, along those lines, the true nature of our own being is very much imminent. Let's say, in in your perspective, rather than transcendent, that we're not trying to go anywhere outside life. This is what it is. This is life. You're yeah. fulfilling human needs and enjoying stretching and enjoying yoga and well, we don't even, along these lines, have to even really bother to be kind about each other. Well, why don't we just stretch all day and enjoy that and fulfill our human needs? And Well, well you know, that's what most people, that's what most people do anyway. But, you know, do we, should we not have higher aspirations with the yoga? Well, most, that's what most of the yoga people do anyway. A lot, yeah. of, a lot of people hide behind the veneer of a spirituality, oh. of a spirit, spiritual being kind to each other. And then behind their backs, they will... Uh, sneer and be unkind. Well, yes, but are, are we not trying to do anything? You know, it's that there's a lot of there's a lot of dishonesty in spirituality. You know, people cover over their own shadows and uh, pretend to be something that they're not, and that's you know, and that goes under the name of yoga. All right. So, what's your aims with yoga now? 
just uh, to enjoy it. <laughs> well, to enjoy it as best I can. And also to, to support other people who also want to enjoy it. Why would you bother doing that if you're just fulfilling human needs? If there's no meat, if there's no... Because that fulfills my human need. Because that fulfills my human need. Just it fulfills you. So you're helping them just to fulfill yourself. Yes, because that's a, that's a gift that we have for each other. We enjoy it, uh, fulfilling each other's needs. That's why we do anything for anybody. Because it meets our own need to uh, meet another's need. And another's, another's need is a gift for us. But again, these aren't my ideas. These are ideas of uh, Marshall Rosenberg, but they, you know, they really uh, resonate with me. But everything we do, we do for ourselves. And then, you know, you, you give something, you get something. You don't, do, you don't do something for the for the benefit of mankind. You do it for yourself. And then you use the story that you're doing it for the benefit of mankind to disguise the fact that you're doing it for yourself so that you appear a certain way in the eyes of others. And you don't think anyone could transcend this, uh, you know, with, it, with yoga or with anything else? I don't think there's any need to, I don't think there's any need to transcend this. I think it's perfect as it is. I think an enlightened egoism is a very beautiful thing. We we love to give to each. We love. Wouldn't it be nice to see outside the individual? Why, why, why would we want to do that? To have meaning beyond yourself, wouldn't that be a, you know, to beyond fulfilling human needs? If if there's meaning enough with yourself, why would you seek it elsewhere? You know, we we love. I you see. I think love is our essence. We love to give to others. And we love to do things that we love to do. And, you know, the, the more love there is, the, is, you know, the world is a better place. I, I, I love to share yoga. You know, I love to share in the conversation of ideas about yoga. And uh, I love the culture of yoga. I even love the stories of yoga. But... Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't love uh, so much. Well, even they have their place, like lies about yoga or lies about spirituality. You know, I think if there's anything to do, it's to see through the bullshit that we tell ourselves and that we tell others. You know, I think that's that's real yoga practice right there. It's just to see through our own bullshit. How do you practice yoga and not get caught in the same loop of just simply using it as a comfort blanket and can, you know and just continuing your daily life? Or how, do, how does it become something more? I think it it, it requires it. I think it maybe. I mean, I'm not sure that this is true, but I think maybe it requires the intention to be honest with yourself. As the, one of my favorite uh, series of talks is by a guy called Anthony DeMello, and. Uh, you know, you can find this, I think it's on archive.org. Anthony DeMello Awareness. It's, I, I still listen to it. I've listened to it lots of times. And one of the first things he says in this uh, discourse is, spirituality is about waking up. And most people, they don't want to wake up. And when he says wake up, what I, what I imagine that referring to is just being honest having self-honesty. And I think the first place that we begin is seeing that we don't want that. <clears throat> I think that's the beginning. I think honesty would transcend egoic perceptions. Could be. So what happens when you die? What happens when you die? Because I mean, death is a big topic. It's a big topic in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. It's a big topic in, in yoga philosophy. Think of Krishna at the moment of death. You know, there is this idea of reincarnation. You know, it's it's a it's a clever one. You know, that you you know, and and the ejection from the cycle of samsara. Well, what's your ideas on that? The belief in it doesn't hold any attraction to me. 
it, for me, it's a nice idea. The idea of a, right. but it's clearly there within the yoga philosophy. So how does that fit into this pantheon of yours? Yeah, it's there in the yoga philosophy, but I don't buy the yoga philosophy hook, line, and sinker. Okay, you know, there's parts of it I, I like, and there's parts of it I, that I don't like. It's like, uh, you know, I didn't you know, join a church where I have to believe any every line of the catechism, you know, it's like, okay, so that's one way they deal with this uh, problem of the question of what happens to us. But, you know, f- where I stand with that is, I don't know, I haven't died yet. You know? Along these lines, how do you teach Ashtanga then? Now, how do you present it as a method for for your students, like what do you say uh, about I, the tradition I, of I'm, it? I mean, we used to be really big on the tradition. You know, it's handed down. You've got this lineage. You know, like if you do this system, then you know, in a certain way, you know, it will produce these certain results. You know, what do you say to them? Uh, I don't really. I just present the practice as I know it. I don't talk about the uh, tradition or the. You know, I, I like to. I mean, I do like to talk about yoga philosophy. I do like to present the chanting and uh, you know some of the the mythologies behind that, some of the the stories behind that. So why do you uh, say what, we're going we're to chant now? Um, there's no reason for it. Um, nope. <laughs> just just do it because you because because you love. I think the best reason to do anything is because you enjoy it because you love to do it. And I, I, I love chanting. But we usually love something because we have some sense of meaning behind it. We're going to do this and it's going to mean this and the vibration means this and it's, you know, it's connected to an essence and you know, it's going to free us from our suffering because you know, we can enjoy. That's, that's going way too far for me. That's going way too far. Well, I'm not saying I believe every part of this. I'm just trying to bring things out of you, mate. You know, it's, it's like I imagine myself like a magpie, right? Going around, you know, the way... Do you remember you used to get those milk bottles which which had the shiny tops? Yes. yes. You're maybe you're maybe old enough to remember that. Adam. The milkman would come around and you'd have the shiny tops. And the, the magpies, they would come and they would get the bottle tops and they'd bring them back to their nests. Yeah. So they feather their nests with these bright, shiny objects. Right? And that's what we do too. We like to feather the nest of our of our identities with different shiny objects that we like the look of or we like the sound of and you know i've i've fully immersed myself when you were 20 and someone had said this to you would you have really got into ashtanga they just said well there's nothing really it's just it's just a bit of stretching you know like just about being, <laughs> see, on, about being honest i didn't with say yourself. it quite like that i didn't say it quite like that um, okay i mean that could well very be the case and yeah. there could be something more to it i mean to be honest with you, I don't know. Some days it does feel like that, or some days I will project uh, something more onto it, uh, and then another days I'll see. All right, that's just a projection. I can I can let that go. But uh, would I have got into? I have no idea. You know, I might I might have done. It it just seemed it just it it fit my it fit my particular requirements in that day and i i i love the culture of yoga but i'm under no illusions that it's anything other than a culture you know like i used to love i used to love indie bands and you know the smiths and well, that's an early indie band isn't it um it's like it's the the you know the yoga, it's it's like Krishna saying in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, as one person goes through from one life to the next, it's like discarding clothes and putting on new clothes. And we do the same thing in our lives. You know, we go from one identity, which is a, you know, clothes that you're wearing, to uh, another identity. And those identities that we put on well, those are the clothes that he's talking about discarding. Yoga is one of those identities. It's a form of culture that we that we put on. There's nothing wrong with you know. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a stark reality you're presenting. I think. Um, 
what about if someone comes to you and suffering, you know, and you're a teacher, right? Like, do you consider yourself a teacher? No, well, I don't consider no, myself. No, a teacher. I wouldn't. Have I so. consider myself <laughs> if, if I will. So if if I'm if I'm getting ahead of yeah. myself, yeah, uh, I'm getting. If I'm getting ahead of myself, I think of myself as a teacher. And if I think of myself as a teacher, then things usually start to go wrong. What I would like to think, you know, I can teach things. I can teach what I know. I can teach Ekam here, Dwe here, Trini here. I can do that, right? So if that's the definition of being a teacher, it's just sharing something, sharing a piece of culture that you've learned. Yes, I'm a teacher. But this idea of being a teacher has a connotation of something different like being kind of like a guide or something like that. I mean, if anything, what I can do is I can support people in the, in the Ashtanga tradition. I can be a, a pratishta, right? A foundation for them to explore what they want to explore through the practice. So I can do that by virtue of having done it myself and continuing to do it myself. I can support people in that. Uh, but if anything, I mean, what I would really like to be for I, for people is just a friend. Rather than being a teacher, just being a friend. And that's what friends do for each other. They support each other. And, you know, also, I'm, I'm fully aware that my uh, practice is supported by the people who come to my class. So they're the support for me to do the thing that supports them in whatever way it does. So, we're, I mean, essentially, we're all in it together. Whether you're a so-called teacher or not a so-called teacher, we're all in it together. The students are supporting the so-called teachers. And the so what does your knowledge consist of then? Is it anything more than a bit the person knows themselves? Or are you, are you actually passing on any information as of any well, use to these when, people? Well, when you've done something for 20 years for, you know, for X many of hours a day, uh, you do have a certain level of expertise. So, you know, I can see somebody's body and I don't know what it is because, you know, I'm not great with an anatomy or anything like that, but I have a certain intuition about maybe what this person's body's intelligence, what would be the best way of facilitating this person's bodily intelligence to express itself? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's completely experimental. I have no idea what I'm doing. So there are better or worse ways. I mean, someone could potentially express, say, well, I like stretching this way. I enjoy it in this way. And, you know, who are you to say? Well, I, I do it within the, 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 container of the tradition of Ashtanga Yoga. So I, I pretty much keep to that, both like in my own practice and when I share it with other people. You know, I may, you know maybe a few modifications here. So there is a benefit of the tradition. You're still, you're still in the tradition. You find a benefit of it. What is it? It's the benefit of that tradition, of that schemata, that method, which is... I, I, really, in, I really enjoy it as a, as a container, as a, as a way of providing structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it provides, it provides, for me, I, I like the structure that it provides. But I know people who work with bodies and who can also like uncover, help people uncover the intelligence of their body who don't work with structure. You know, this just happens to be the way that I've got into it. And I don't think it's, uh, there's a better way or there's a worse way. I think it's got to do with just the person and you know there'll be some people who will resonate with the way i do things and who will be open to the suggestions i make and there'll be some people who who won't resonate with that and they're they'll be much better off going to somebody else well, we've done about an hour and um, let's just end on a high note what what do you um give me one inspiration something that inspires you and um i don't have to have to ask you pleasure question give me a guilty pleasure <laughs> uh, sorry what's the what's the first thing adam just an inspiration something inspires you it can be a person a place a quality anything well i talked about this guy uh marshall rosenberg and uh i came across his teachings last year and i i find him incredibly inspiring just seeing the quality of uh a humanness that's possible 
in how we can relate with each other in uh, in a vulnerable, open way where we're expressing our needs as gifts. I, I it's just uh, such a beautiful thing to have uh, to to have seen and encountered and even tried my hand at. Although it's much more difficult than yoga. Uh, guilty pleasure uh, uh, trading cryptocurrency oh really you go into that <laughs> interesting you having any luck you, get, you good at it uh, it's not looking too bad at the moment uh. <laughs> although the markets the cryptocurrency markets are currently going are, are going pretty well so but I, I got into that after of course having lost a lot of money interesting well, not a lot of money yeah. for you know yeah, yeah. Having lost a bit. Yeah. So I I spent some time kind of looking at charts for a long time. And then seeing if there was seeing if there was a better way of doing it. Cryptocurrency. Interesting. That's that's a new one. That's 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 usually people tell me chocolate chocolate or Netflix. So (laughs) so not chocolate as well. I mean there's other ones. Chocolate Netflix not so much because yeah, right, there's so many now because it's just it's a human needs. You've got so many human needs, haven't you? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I was going to say, I was going to say, what happens? The thing is, the problem here is because what happens when it, one human need gets in the way of, say, your wish to help others, right? How do you manage that? Well, I, I think there's a fundamental trust that uh, with your human need for food, and then you're in a desert <laughs> island with a certain amount of food. You know, I don't tend to approach things from a restless. I don't really approach things from a rationalist perspective. I mean, I have a, I I have a I have a trust in in the I have a trust in life. Okay. And I have a trust that life knows best. So there is some divine, um, but, uh, divine intelligence then. Well, except that it happens to be running through everything. So it's not it's not a it's not a special thing. <laughs> I knew you were advisor. <laughs> hmm? I, I I knew a vital leadings. It makes it very hard to, to argue with an advisor person. Um, I wouldn't I, I no, I wouldn't say I was You wouldn't say advisor either. No, no, I'm not gonna pin anything. Not at all. I'm pin anything on you. Well, but hopefully not. Hopefully not. If you've pinned something on me, I've I have my work to do. <laughs> I will. I will. When you come like, when you come over and, and see me soon, I'm going to pin something on you. But we're we're off camera. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks for joining me, Luke. It's been wonderful to have you. Thanks, Adam.